And now it's our pleasure to introduce Dr. Hugh Nibley. And Dr. Nibley has a title which may be interesting to all of you budding authors, namely, How to Write an Anti-Mormon Book, Dr. Nibley. Now, brethren and sisters, we go literally, I mean literally, from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> We're going to talk about... There's nothing I would less like to talk about than this, and I know less about, but I was asked to by somebody else. See, we're coming down in the world now, so we've got to let this thing down. No, no, that's all right. A small enough hall. We've all read anti-Mormon books and been annoyed by them, um, especially by the things we couldn't put our finger on. We know that something's being slipped over on us, but we know exactly what it is. And last year, there appeared on the market, and I do mean the market, this uh, typical run-of-the-mill anti-Mormon book, which deserves our attention, if only because it's a perfect epitome and summary of all other anti-Mormon books. <laughs> the reader who takes the trouble to investigate will soon discover that Mr. Wallace, Mr. Irving Wallace... Now, look, and should I shout or turn this thing out here? Right about here. Boom. Well, I could hang up the paper there like a house down. <laughs> like I'm playing a solo. But you'll soon discover that Irvin Wallace's 27th wife is nothing but a warmed over left, uh, warmed up leftovers of uh, Ann Eliza Young's or Eliza Ann uh, Webb D. Young Dennings, um, 19, wife number 19. And that in turn is as she says it is, inspired, there's nothing different from what you'll find in Mrs. Stenhouse's book here, her full expose of Mormonism. And you'll find that Mrs. Stenhouse is simply repeating the stories of Mary Burton and uh, the uh, Beadle, the ghostwriter, who was also Eliza Ann Young's ghostwriter. He, uh, he was here in Utah a while and then was in Chicago. And that he wrote, he was also ghostwriter for Bill Hickman, and the author of The Day Nights, and uh, you may not also notice that uh, this beetle authenticates his Hickman stories by appealing to Judge Harding for a first-hand account of Mormonism, which Judge Harding takes from Pomeroy Tucker, who in turn got it from J.C. Bennett, E.D. Howe, Obadiah Dogberry. So we see ancient <laughs> and devious brotherhood of Mormon historians busily passing the same stock stories around from book to book. They do this. After 85 years of diligent non-Mormon research, Mr. Wallace, in retelling Analyze's story, has not a single significant detail to add after 85 years. That's rather astonishing. <laughs> Since Alexander Campbell's first blast 130 years ago, nothing has been learned and nothing has been forgotten. What makes this remarkable is the uniform claim by all anti-Mormon writers that they are, what they're telling is a mere sampling, just a drop in the bucket to terrible things they could tell, but none of those other things ever turn up. Anne Eliza Young herself says in her 1875 book she could easily write another book of 600 pages which would be far worse than this one. Well, in 1908 she tried to do it and she didn't have a, a single thing to tell and a lot less than she did in her 1875 book. The conclusion is obvious, a single corpus of anti-Mormon lore from which all non-Mormon writers draw irresponsibly and uncritically. The farther we get from the original sources, the less able and inclined we are to examine their validity, so that what once passed muster only because the public, uh, at the fervid behest of the ministry, was desperately determined to believe it true, now gets by because nobody will take the trouble to examine it. The result is a truly remarkable uniformity of anti-Mormon literature of any generation, one only has to compare Mr. Wallace's book with those of John Hyde or Pomeroy Tucker to see how little has changed. The material is the same. The treatment is the same. It is a genre of literature as marked and distinctive as a minstrel show. It is unchanging and ageless as a mummy and for the same reason. It was born dead. It's contrived and it's unreal. There's an air of great unreality about this stuff. The air of unreality that haunts this highly unimaginative and unfactual literature is nowhere more apparent than in its latest triumph. Mr. Wallace's book, in which no character comes alive, reviewers have noticed this for a moment, we are still in a world of the myth-makers. But Mr. Wallace is not a myth-maker. He is a mythographer, <laughs> as the Greeks would call him. It's the art of the mythographer which we shall now describe. How does one go about producing a new expose of Mormonism? We only have time now for ten rules, and we'll illustrate 
with one illustration from, for each of them from Mr. Wallace and uh, Annalise Young. In the first place, you must bear in mind that you are entering upon a very controversial field. Therefore, rule one, your first step should be to make it clear that at last, after years of groping and speculation based on what Mr. Wallace calls, quote, a mass of lies and contradictions, which furnishes the evidence, you have come forth with the plain unvarnished truth. Show that you are peculiarly chosen and fitted for your task, declaring your unique and perfect freedom from prejudice. <laughs> this is what Mr. Wallace writes. He says, I emerged from my researches with my objectivity unblurred. A marvelous man, you must admit, he says to himself. But why can't he let the reader, <laughs> why can't he let the reader decide whether he's prejudiced or not? Then he goes on, he says, During close to three years of intensive research on Annalisa and on her church, I became neither anti-Mormon nor pro-Mormon. Here is a phenomenon. He neither believes in modern-day revelation, neither, nor does he deny it. Well, the only way he can do that is to leave it strictly alone, of course, but he doesn't. He's writing a book about it. It's an interesting thing. And incidentally, what justifies this here? The real object of attack in his book isn't Brigham Young at all. It's Joseph Smith you'll find the real attack is on Joseph Smith here. That's why it's relevant to our present discussion. But uh, remember what Brother Romney told us the other day? Only those, the things of God can be only known by the Spirit of God. Can you say that you do not accept modern-day revelation, neither do you reject it? It's an absurd proposition, unless you leave it strictly alone, as I say, but he hasn't done that. Well... Refer gently but firmly, as Mr. Wallace does, to the bias and prejudice, however unconscious, of other books on the Mormons. Take non-Mormon writers kindly to task for their disturbing tendency toward exaggeration and hysteria. Uh, what, uh, the way Wallace puts it, he says, Mrs. Uh, Brody's unremitting hysteria on every page mars her prose. It doesn't disqualify her as a historical source or anything like that. It mars her prose. Hysteria on every page, he says. <laughs> Take non-Mormon writers kindly to task for their disturbing tendency toward exaggeration and hysteria, thereby making clear to your readers that you are above such things. Protest your love for the Mormon people. This is a part of principle number one here. <laughs> Establishing, first of all, your qualifications. Protest your love for the Mormon people and your freedom from all personal rancor and meanness. Show your tolerant and humane attitude by allowing the Mormons a, hu a few human failings. That will make your story more plausible and, for that reason, far more damning. When, having established your Olympian detachment, you proceed to lower the beam. <laughs> Be homey and folksy. Always refer to Mrs. Eliza Ann, D., uh, Ann Webb D. Young Denning as Ann Eliza. Since it's interesting, her contemporaries always seem to refer to her as Eliza Ann. Uh, and Brigham Young is always Brigham, and of course, just as in Mrs. Brody's book, it's always Joseph, never Joseph Smith. That shows you have an intimate, personal insight into your subject and puts everything on a friendly, <laughs> frank basis. It's referring to Joseph. They do this. Well, now, um, of hardly less importance, our second point, once you've established your own lack of prejudice and high qualifications to write this book, of hardly less importance than building up an image of yourself as a person of perfect integrity and boundless charity is the need for establishing your scholarly qualifications in the reader's mind. Nowadays, writes Trevor Roper in a very interesting new book on modern historiography, he says, to carry conviction, a historian must document or appear to document his formal narrative, but his background, his generalizations, allusions, comparisons remain happily free from this inconvenience. We shall refer to the background in due time. First, we must consider the means by which our anti-Mormon writer can document or appear to document his formal narrative, as Trevor Roper puts it. Naturally, you want, first of all, first-hand material. This is surprisingly easy to find. Old photographs and engravings can be picked up with very little trouble and are very impressive evidence of research and direct contract with one's period. You can get hundreds of them over in the library here. Here, for example, in, uh, to show that uh, Wallace has done thorough research is a picture of the Lion House, another one of the Beehive House. And here's a cut from Mrs. Young's own book. And here's the title page of Mrs. Young's book. Well, of course, they're available at any library in the country of any size at all, all these pictures. But it looks as if, you've, if you're really right, right there. You were there. It makes no difference what the subject of the picture is. A cartoon lampooning Brigham Young. There's one here published after his death, showing a lot of wives in bed, you see, this sort of thing. <laughs> you could pick that up anywhere. The library acquired day before yesterday a beautiful book uh, of this type published by the editor of the Police Gazette by an apostle's wife, 1882. 
That has the most lurid pictures I've ever seen yet. But uh, <laughs> it makes no difference what the subject of the picture is. A cartoon lampooning Brigham Young, an engraving from the Police Gazette, a portrait of anybody connected in any way with the story, pictures of anything from the time, locomotives, patented machines, famous catastrophes, anything will do to show that you, so to speak, were there. An imposing appendix, and this is a very important part here, it's a very long appendix, all this. An imposing appendix is a must. The bulkier it is and the more names you cram into it, the more intimidating it will appear and the less the reader will feel like checking up on anything. Be sure to waive your credentials. Remind the reader from time to time, as Mr. Wallace does, that your book represents almost three years of intensive research. Be lavish in bestowing thanks and bouquets on the vast army of workers who have assisted you. Mr. Wallace is hard to beat in this department. Who would not feel ob obligated to accept this book without further question, if only out of a decent respect for that host of skilled researchers, this is a quotation from Mr. Wallace's appendix, who gave so selflessly of their time and energies co to collaborate with me in my attempt to preserve a remarkable woman for history. The least we can do is share Mr. Wallace's gratitude to quote again several hundred organizations of every description who cooperated in answering inquiries. This is an excellent example to follow. Thank everybody for valuable information, even if the information was only that the party was not at home or that he had none to offer. And this happened. A number of people I've talked to whose names are mentioned with gratitude here simply told him he wasn't there and resent their names being here. They didn't tell him a thing, but it was information. After all, I won't tell you anything. Well, that was information. Uh, in fact, one woman in Salt Lake is quite astonished and put out to find her name here quite prominently mentioned. List all the names you can, whether the people like it or not. Express deep-felt regrets at having to pass by hundreds more in silence for lack of space. Name every library at which you and your assistants have thumbed through a card index as having rendered eager and invaluable assistance. <laughs> Become dewy-eyed over the ceaseless and altruistic efforts of your devoted and selfless staff. Make it apparent that your book was something of a public crusade, an idealistic enterprise into which an army of citizens entered with public spirit enthusiasm. Eager volunteers to the great cause of truth. Analyze Young did all these things, and Mr. Wallace has faithfully followed her example. It is important to establish an unchallenged intellectual ascendancy at the outset of your book. Open your story, therefore, with a volley of random and promiscuous erudition calculated to intimidate any potential critics and beat the opposition flat before they can object to your first serious slip. Anything will do. Tell about the century in which your characters lived, as this man does. This was the time when the stout, stuffy little Victoria was bustling with 50 trunks. Have an assistant look up the technical word to describe the type of trunk between Balmoral and wherever it was. This was the time when the lights were burning late in whatever street it was on which Pasteur had his laboratory. You might mention Pasteur's whiskers, intimate details. This was the time when Daniel Holm the wizard was electrifying whatever crowned heads he electrified with his magic stunt, and so on and so on. You can look up all the details or have somebody else do it and then toss them all off in a casual, off-handed manner that shows how well you know your way around in the field. There is no limit to this sort of thing. When you've gathered a nice fat handful of three-by-fives, throw them smartly in the reader's face before he has got to page 20. That will put him in his place if he's the kind who likes to ask annoying questions. Well, now you've established that you're an unbiased person, you're highly qualified, and also that you're a scholar. And uh, now we have our third point. <clears throat> What we have been recommending in point two is what Trevor Roper calls the second principle of this new technique, namely, and this is quoting from him, the principle of unequal scholarship, the scrupulous straining at small historical gnats, which diverts attention from the silent digestion of large and inconvenient camels. How choosily they nibble when the matter is of no great significance, thus winning tributes to their scholarship from lay reviewers. And yet what enormous gulps they take when no one, they think, is looking. An excellent demonstration of this technique is Mr. Wallace's description of Analyze Young's Escape from Utah, where in a tale that is one absurdity after another, he is at pains to remind us no less than three times that the train went exactly 22 miles an hour. Though he misinterpreted the information, which was that trains between Ogden and Denver averaged 22 miles an hour, still he actually went to the trouble to look up such a minor detail. Not 23 miles an hour, not 21 miles an hour, 22. In face of such scrupulous attention, even to the smallest detail, it would be churlish to question the rest of Mr. Wallace's story. Remind us, this is unequal scholarship. See, straining at this little gnat, making so meticulous, show how careful you have been in your research, while she tells this fantastic story of her escape, which she made up. 
It is important to one who would make the fullest use of the principle of unequal scholarship to avoid footnotes if that is at all possible. A huge bibliography is the answer. It looks very impressive and you don't have to be responsible for a thing. The very few anti-Mormon writers who have risked footnotes have got themselves into serious trouble as a result. Since every item in your book ostensibly had to be found somewhere, it would be quite easy to specify which item comes from which source. You had to look it up in the first place, you see. Very little trouble and expense is involved in the operation, but a great deal of risk. The main objection to footnotes, if you happen, as Mr. Wallace does, to be getting 90% of your information from two or three books, is that they give you away. Without footnotes, on the other hand, not one reader in a thousand suspects that all those hundreds of sources indicated in your appendix are nothing but eyewash. Since it is your purpose to make your reader believe that you have used all those sources equally and fairly, it is foolish to throw away your advantage by letting him question you too closely. Here you have in your book a huge indiscriminate mass of statements varying in reliability from complete certainty to total mendacity. Over against this you place your appendix, a huge and indiscriminate mass of sources, also varying from high reliability to utter worthlessness. Now the ingenious reader might want to know the ingenuous reader, rather, might want to know which stories come from which sources and insist that it does no good to prate a lot of titles and names as an appendage to a lot of gossip unless one knows who's telling which, who is telling which stories. The bibliography is meaningless. To such a one, the reader has a ready answer. He is perfectly free to find out for himself. You have told your stories, you have given your sources, the rest is up to him. You see what a magnificent advantage this gives the reader. Rather, the, the writer, not the reader. He has to find out for himself which stories have been filched from entirely unreliable sources and which are come, have been well authenticated. You can never tell from this book. It all sounds equally reliable. Well, this takes us to our fourth question, fourth rule. Questions of evidence, especially when one is making grave criminal charges, as anti-Mormons all, writers all make, can be very troublesome. There is only one way to handle them. Let them alone. In the place of evidence, use rhetoric. The ancients discovered that any public prefers rhetoric to evidence. They also discovered that the basic principles of rhetorical method are two. One, the ecos, as they call it. That is, building up a case not on facts but on probabilities, which is much more interesting and uh, can be subjected to definite rules. Number two is the use of the loci communis. That is, the standard responses to standard situations. Hence, our word commonplace comes from that. That's the use of familiar stock phrases and emotive words of tested reliability. We can illustrate these two principles and how they work in a situation which we'll call the house that Jack built. And then we can illustrate from a case of, uh, from our writer here. It is common knowledge that Jack built a house. Now notice the little phrases we use. It is common knowledge that Jack built a house. It is that house which we are now discussing. <coughs> there are rumors that a good deal of malt, very probably stolen, was stored in the house. What lends probability to the report is the building of the house itself by Jack. Why a house if not to store the stolen malt? <laughs> Next step, it is said that the malt was eaten by rats and in view of the high nutriment content of malt, see Appendix A for reference to scholarly and scientific studies proving beyond a doubt that malt is nutritious, <laughs> there is no good reason for doubting this report. Number four, rats may very probably have been killed by a cat, as some believe, and there is certainly nothing intrinsically improbable in the event. On the contrary, studies made at the Rodent Institute of the University of so-and-so <laughs> report that only one rat, or report and so forth. The report that only one rat ate the malt is, of course, erroneous, since the consumption of such a large quantity of malt would require many years and probably a large number of rats. <laughs> that the cat was chased by a dog is only to be expected. Only a fanatic would question it. The same applies to to uh, the dogs being tossed by a cow, though that's admittedly a less common event. At any rate, always use this at any rate. Whenever you've listed a lot of improbable things, wind up at any rate. At any rate, a very useful expression, I think you'll find it more than 100 times used in these books, um, we can be reasonably certain that the cow was milked by a milkmaid. What other kind of a maid could it have been? And also, since there's no good reason to doubt it, that the milkmaid, whose name may have been Bertha, was wooed by a man tattered and torn. There are unmistakable references in the newspapers of the time, or at most of a generation later, of poorly dressed men known as tramps roaming about the country. <laughs> there can therefore be little doubt that Bertha was engaged to a passionate, engaged in a passionate and public wooing. The date of Bertha's marriage to her tattered lover is not known exactly. 
how much better it is than simply say not known. Not known exactly is even truer, isn't it? If we don't know at all, you say not known exactly. <laughs> but it sounds as if you were making a, a more careful research than you had ever made. But you make it. The name of Bertha's marriage to her tatterdemalion lover is not known exactly, but it could have been late sometime late in January, 1858. Could have been, of course, in February, 1942, but it could have been then, you see. Though there's no evidence that Bertha was badly mistreated by the man who wooed her so passionately, there's no good reason for doubting it, especially in view of what has gone before. Now, what have we here? Nothing at all. Yet we have given the world a suffering Bertha and her brutal spouse without having proved a thing, without having to prove a thing. We have created a little world of our own and given it a story. From here on, we can build up Bertha's biography in a way that will make every fair-minded reader fairly burn with indignation. But one thing is needed to give it all historical reality, to connect it up in some way with real historical events, with the Mormons or anything else. That, would, that should not be hard, since once you have made the connection, no matter how tenuous, your whole tale springs to life as real history. Now, here's an example from, from uh, Wallace, the way he works. Because Chauncey, notice it's Chauncey, it, it's Mr. Webb, that's Analyze Young's father, but he's Chauncey to him, you see. Because Chauncey has written, notice the loaded words too, because Chauncey had written in the community, Brigham Young considered him a valuable Mormon. As such, Chauncey was ordered to serve a tour of duty as a missionary. Tied closer to the church than ever by polygamy, Chauncey was forced to comply. On his mission, Chauncey decided, without too much pain, it may be assumed, that an English girl as a wife might be more decorative than the homegrown product. So he married an English girl. Well, see how the whole thing is, is built up. Or the... Uh, story of Joseph Smith. I don't think I have time to go into his account of the, of the first vision. That's a good example of how this has worked. But here's a good one. Here's one here. Uh, take this little paragraph on why Joseph Smith introduced polygamy. And what's the word? The prophet had been, we should ring a bell or a buzzer every time we get a, one of these uh, loci communis here, one of these loaded words. The prophet had been intrigued by the polygamic practices of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Solomon, and David. There is little doubt that he believed that the plural wife system was the God-favored system of marriage. Beyond this, there may have been decisive personal factors that influenced him. Notice how vague every word is. Quite possibly, his useless and forbidding wife. Evidently, Smith had a roving eye. <laughs> yet, yet, his stern puritanical upbringing did not give him the easy conscience of a rake. He could not allow himself a mistress, and so, possibly, to have his cake and eat it too, he allowed himself a plurality of wives. However, Smith realized that he could only make it acceptable for himself if he made it acceptable, it acceptable to his wide followings. Or perhaps, as the Mormons insist, none of this elaborate intrigue was necessary, for Smith did receive, and he underlines that, an order from on high. At any rate, Smith began to devote himself to premature polygamy. Note here that every sentence is speculative. Every word which we have put into italics here is an escape hatch in case one should hold Mr. Wallace to his thesis. And this paragraph is the cornerstone of his whole work. How does he know that Emma, to whom Joseph Smith was devoted all his life, was useless and forbidding? Or that Smith in his secret heart realized this or that? But now we come to the supreme artistry of this pivotal paragraph. At the end, by a well-known rhetorical trick, Wallace thrust before the reader, after presenting his conclusions with no evidence whatever, an alternative so utterly ridiculous that one has no choice but to reject it. Or perhaps Smith did receive an order from on high. This under, the underlining of that did is not, only, is not only superbly ironical, it puts you in Wallace's little trap. What if there's no evidence to support his thesis? Look at the alternative. You have no choice. He must be right after all. Well, now we get point number five. See, we have lots of these. We will recall that Trevor Roper's first principle had two parts. Nowadays, to carry conviction, a, historic, a historian must document or appear to document his formal narrative. That is the first part. But his background, his generalizations, his allusions, comparisons remain happily free from this inconvenience. This freedom is very useful. Against it, against this imaginary background, even correctly stated facts can be wonderfully transformed. That is the second element, the background. Once you have that firmly established, facts need not bother you. If we can firmly establish in the reader's mind, for example, uh, here we have some 
Well, if you can firmly establish in the reader's mind that Lincoln was a, was a mountebank, as certain people have, have believed, then anything you say about him is colored. Colored, yes. Um, <laughs> I was going to find one interesting reference here. Did I leave it? But the atmosphere is everything. What he's doing in this book is building up an atmosphere, and once you've got that, it doesn't make any difference in the world what the facts are. The damage is done. That's what he's pointing out here. He says, against this background, once the readers accepted it, even correctly stated facts can be wonderfully transformed. What an anti-Mormon book conveys is not a history of this or that person or persons, but an atmosphere. This is what concerns Wallace on every page. There are certain tried and true tricks to evoke this atmosphere. None is more effective than the use of loaded words, for atmosphere is the rhetorician specially. For example, Brigham Young never asks for anything in this book. He always commands. One never refers to his wives, but always to his harem. Uh, though Wallace himself is quite aware that anything less like an oriental harem could not be imagined, as he says. The reader never learns how the Mormon church operated or how is it organized. Instead, he's always referred darkly and vaguely to the hierarchy. The members are always referred to as the underlings and so forth. Why does Wallace fill pages with crude humor of Artemis Ward without even bothering to paraphrase? Can he seriously believe these heavy-handed Yankee jokes? Of course not, but they do make Brigham Young look silly. And then he says, in a sense, well, this may be true. We may take it for what it's worth. Um, and so we get these typical things. If... Uh, Knowing perfectly well that John Hyde is giving a false picture of the temple ordinances, Wallace nevertheless quotes his lurid story at length, taking care to designate him as Elder John Hyde, though he wasn't an elder, he wrote that, because Mr. Hyde leaves a very nasty taste in our mouth, and of course, that's what you want. That's your atmosphere. It would be hard to find a more impressive demonstration of how an entire history can be compounded of nothing but the faintest rumors and weakest possible evidence mixed with great turgid clouds of atmosphere than is offered in the story of the mysterious Danites, which, of course, we can't get on here because that's, that's a long story. Um, well, we'll get on to point six here. We had some good ones on atmosphere, but moving along. Well... In the field of anti-Mormon writing, the most successful influential work has been done by women. This is to be expected, since, as Mr. Wallace reminds us, under polygamy it was the women who suffered while the men had all the fun. This, his authority for that statement, incidentally, was a woman, and he has made a wise choice in play, placing himself firmly behind the skirts of Miss, Mrs. Anna Eliza Young, who is thereby made responsible for any libelous or impossible statement he chooses to make. He says, oh, well, don't blame me, this was Anna Eliza. A woman's license to gossip is universally recognized as it is the chivalrous obligation of the reading public not to question a lady's word too closely. And they exploit that a lot. Then, too, it adds pathos and punch to be able to remind one's readers constantly, as Wallace does, of the fragile and helpless nature of one's subject as a woman and a victim of male tyranny. A woman's franchise to gossip includes unlimited freedom to invent conversations, and there are some beauties, of course, in analyzing uh, as Wallace does, a fragile... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Wallace, of course, he, ad he adopts these and he improves on them, too. Mr. Wallace put Ann Eliza Young's inventive, invented conversations to good use, adds little touches of his own to make them appear both more convincing and more sinister. In case he's taken to task, he can, of course, refer the reader to Mrs. Young and let her take the rap for being irresponsible. Even more important, however, are certain absolute immunities which the claims of modesty bestow on the sex, and all your books use this. A woman knows some simply terrible stories about the Mormons, but she's too much of a lady to repeat them, so she always keeps hinting about these terrible stories, but she doesn't have to tell them. So all she does is to insist that there are such things going on. This does the Mormons no good at all, just as much damage or more, in fact, than if she told the story, while it places the lady beyond question. This is a favorite device of Madame Stenhouse and Young, it is amusing to see these Victorian ladies wallowing in lucrative sensationalism while protesting themselves oh so proper. But it does no great credit to a modern man of Mr. Wallace's kidney when he protests his fastidious reluctance at reporting a thing which he goes out of his way to dig up. We blush more than he does when with downcast eyes and maidenly protestations he expresses his shock at a passage which he then proceeds to quote at length. <laughs> the only really scandalous thing in the Journal of Discourses is a, a remark made about Brigham Young about dress. It was a coarse remark. It wasn't obscene, but it was coarse enough. 
And Brigham went too far that time. Well, the only thing he quotes from the whole journal, of course, is that, of course. But first, oh, this is terrible. This is almost unprintable. I don't want to tell you this, but uh, <laughs> this is the way it is. But feeling, <laughs> feeling so fastidious about it. Um, in indulging... Well, <clears throat> here, for example... Now, this is typical of how these women operate. This is Miss Stenhouse. She says, she regrets that though I have endeavored to tell it all, underlining tell it all, in the conduct and publicly expressed opinions of Brigham Young and many of the leaders, there have been such disgusting atrocities and such impure statements that for the sake of decency and propriety, I dared not even mention them. Mention what? Naturally, she won't have to prove what she won't even mention, but that's the trick. She has mentioned it. She's already told us the worst. Uh, here... She tells of a, of a Mormon catechism so obscene that she dared not repeat it. There's no evidence for this, she explains, because it has been bought up so successfully by Brigham that it is doubtful if there is a copy of it in existence. So that settles that. But Anne Eliza Young takes the story up there. At the time, a sheltered child living alone with her mother not only remembers the catechism, but also exactly how obscene it was. What a precocious child she must, must have been to recognize such dirty stuff. And here's the way they work. Mrs. Stenhouse says, one man confessed to having stolen a sheep. And then along comes Aunt Eliza Young, and she says, yes, and I was a meeting once, and a man confessed to having stolen a sheep, and I remember a little child, I saw there was wool sticking, sticking to his shoulder. And I thought at the time, that must be the wool of the sheep he was stealing. Now she says, of course, this can't be it. It is just something. But that just shows you the sort of things that are going on. She, it was just too good to be true. She had to invent not only the man stole the sheep, but there at meeting, while he was bearing his testimony, she alone in the audience noticed the wool clinging to his shoulder. Uh, here is another well here Analyza says another volume as large as this would not contain all I could write on this subject I am compelled to silence on points that would make what I have already said seem tame in comparison there are events of daily occurrence which decency and womanly modesty forbid me even hinting at well, what's she doing if not hinting at from here <laughs> even hinting at yet her full bu first book is entitled A Full Exposé of Mormonism she says the real, and this is another, well, this is the, uh, lead us to our seventh point, but uh, the thing is, 35 years later, she produced another book uh, at the urging of the publishers, and she couldn't produce any of these other, just the same old stuff. The seventh uh, rule to follow, what gives anti-Mormon literature its sales appeal in every decade is the combination it presents of a deep mystery and exciting probability. Such things may be so, as a mere novel, they would fall flat for the simple reason that even fairy tales can't be totally preposterous if they are to be listened to. So it's important to insist on the historicity of your tale. Start out by excusing yourself for telling a tale that to any rational reader can only be the purest poppycock. Explain that it is the subject which is to blame, not you. Mr. Wallace does this very prettily with a quotation from Burton. The first thing he puts in his book is a quotation from Burton here. Yes, this is the way he begins. I am conscious that my narrative savors of incredibility the fault is in the subject, not in the narrator. So that clears him from then on. Of course, Burton is a narrator. He's simply describing what he saw, but this man isn't, isn't narrating anything but rehashing Analyze a Young Story. But notice how neatly he passes the buck. Here is the way that uh, Analyze a Young says. She says, The real is so vivid and strange that I need have no recourse to the imaginary. I have added nothing, but I have left much untold. I am accused sometimes of exaggeration. In reply to that accusation, I would say that it is simply impossible. I could not exaggerate. Not a word of all my story is exaggerated or embellished. The difficulty has been rather to suppress and tone down. Just so, Wallace begins his book with a quotation from Richard Burton, and quote, I am conscious that my narrative savors of incredibility. The fault is in the subject, not the narrator. Henceforth, both Analyza and her faithful follower are immune to criticism or doubt. A useful but more heavy-handed device is this of protest as other anti-Mormon writers often do, that you can't exaggerate for the simple reason uh, that you don't like exaggerate for the simple reason that you can't exaggerate. Therefore, since you can't exaggerate, anything you say is an understatement. Well, what, could you be on safer ground than that? It may not have been that bad, but it would have been much worse. Finally, she concludes about Joseph Smith, he says. Well, she says, there's no evidence that he practiced polygamy, but at least if he wasn't a polygamist, he was something infinitely worse. That's all she can say about it. So you would be, it would be charity to believe these polygamy stories about him. <laughs> but your best hope of keeping the reader convinced that such things might be so after all is to exploit the gap, and this is very important, the gap between the reader and the subject. Do not hesitate 
at a place where the normal reader might boggle at the sheer excess of melodrama and monstrous depravity to remind him that he knows nothing at all about it, that he's in no position to question or criticize because all this happened far away at the ends of the earth. To illustrate, Miss Analyze Young takes the position, quote, no one outside of Utah and Mormonism can understand it in the least because nowhere else is there a possibility of such wretchedness to exist. But when experienced observers and hardened reporters came and lived in Utah and liked what they saw, then she shrieked that they didn't have the vaguest inkling of what was really going on because they'd never lived inside the church as she had. This is the ace in the hole for the anti-Mormon writer. Indeed, Mrs. Stenhouse insists that this is the one indispensable qualification for any writer on the subject. According to her, nobody but a polygamous wife who has left Mormonism has any right to write a syllable about any phase of Mormonism. But when large numbers of people came to Salt Lake City, Mrs. Webb, or Analyza here, who had not been in Utah herself for 35 years, shifted her ground again. She says, the trouble is that the Gentiles do not go into the country places. They only visit Salt Lake. Now, if they go to the outside places, they find what really goes on. And so she falls back from one line of defense to the next, always to preserve that unbridgeable gap that makes it impossible for anyone but her to make a reliable statement about the Mormons. The gap is the secret of all successful anti-Mormon writing. For years, an almost complete geographical gap made it impossible for atrocity stories to be invented with complete immunity. There was no way for the people back east to check up. Whenever the gap has been closed, the atrocity stories have disappeared so that we can follow the retreat of the old-style Blood and Thunder Mormon classic, first to Sand Peak, then Panguitch, then Short Creek and the Four Corners. Finally, that gap disappeared completely. People could actually go into that heart of Mormon country whenever they felt like it, and with it, the Mormon atrocity story. After a lull of some years, however, they're all coming back now, you see, the successes of the Mormon church called for a reactivation of the market and a new gap was developing, this time the time gap. Whereas once it had been possible to say with Mrs. Analyza Young, all this happened far away and you must trust me, I was born in the church, I know. It is now possible for Mrs. Von Brody to remind us that all this happened so long ago that only she, born and raised in the church, has been able to discover what really happened. If one actually took the trouble to go out to Utah in the early days, one would, as Mrs. Young reports, with immense disgust, quickly get rid of the brimming prejudices one brought from the East. But who was going to take the trouble to make the trip? That's the poser. That was Mrs. Young's rock of refuge. Today, if one actually takes the trouble to go back into the records of the 1830s and 40s, one quickly discovers how very little there is against Joseph Smith, how flimsy all that is. But again, who is going to take the trouble to make that journey over again? That is Mrs. Brody's ace in the hole in blessed immunity. The gap is still there. Now it's a time gap. Today, the reader has a time gap and the human inertia in its favor. If that's not enough, he is free to create gaps in the record at any time he feels like, uh, like it by useful economy of deft and judicious omissions in his story. In this field, Wallace is a master. We have to rush on now with our eighth rule. An important rule to remember is don't attack anything specific. Attack the image. You have established the atmosphere, now keep working at it. Never attack the thing itself, attack your interpretation of it, which is how the reader now identifies it. Forget the facts, focus on ideas. Wasn't the program of liberal education in the 20s and 30s to free the modern American student from bondage to facts and dates and thereby liberate his mind to deal freely with ideas? A double bookkeeping of the, uh, is a, in order here. You record one thing, but you tell another. Now, we have some good examples of that. Well, now here, how can these ladies say the horrible things they say are preached openly and publicly? They say it, and yet you can check up and do it, because they believe it. These, these ladies actually believe in some of these horrors they tell about. That is the way they interpret what the leaders of the church were saying and doing. In every age, it's been a favorite trick of religious polemic to attack not what the opposition practices or preaches, but our impression of what it practices and preaches. This was, the developed, this was developed into a fine art by the ancient rhetoricians and their apt students, the fathers of the fourth century, but we find it in full flavor in the remains of the earliest anti-Christian writings. Speeches of the pagan Cecilius and the writing Celtus are examples of this art. A great point with the early enemies of the Christian church, that is, used to be the charge that the Christians practice incest. Didn't they call each other brother and sister? And didn't these brothers and sisters intermarry? If a man marries his cousin, that is frowned on in certain societies. If he marries his wife's cousin, that's a different matter. It may be polygamy. It may be against the law of the land. It's not the same thing as marrying his own cousin. Anne Eliza looks upon such a marriage as incest, though she admits it's stretching a point, but not Wallace. Taking up there, from there, he announces without reservation, quote, Brigham Young believed in the practice of incest. Well, it's just Anne Eliza's interpretation of marrying 
close relatives, but they're not your close relatives. They're each other's. You see, that's a different thing. The, uh, well, this is typical. Now, here's, uh, well, I'll give you just one example here. Uh, going on blasphemy is a favorite word here. But here, what, how heartrending this is. What a shock it was to me. That sum of money was gone at a sweep. Can it be possible, said I, that Brigham Young can be so mean as that? Where can his conscience be, or has he any, to deprive me of my hard earnings in this way? He shall not do it. I will make him pay me. What can be the cause for this high-flown tirade against the incredible baseness and meanness of Brigham Young? His utter lack of conscience. Is he robbing the widow of her last might? No. What sets this off is the suggestion by her husband that Mrs. Stenhouse and family pay tithing. They'd never paid it. And this is what it is. Well, from her point of view, it was just as bad as that. It was robbing her. And this is Brigham Young's famous meanness. Here you have the viciousness, the meanness, the depravity of Brigham Young traced to its source. This is Brigham Young, the tyrant at his worst. Well, Mrs. Stenhouse never paid a cent of, si cent of tithing, and neither did Eliza Young. She's quite sincere in this slashing onslaught against Brigham Young's crowning ignominy. But who, after all, is the base, money-loving, greedy wretch? Brigham Young or Mrs. Stenhouse herself? It all depends on your point of view. <laughs> and she's, but she's quite sincere is the point to notice. So that's your eighth point. Attack the image. Attack your idea of Mormonism, and you can get some marvelous results. So we have some good examples here. Um, I'll put an exaggerate. The doctrines are what they, of course, you attack especially. Then, ninth point, be flexible. Be willing to change. Feel the public pulse. Each new anti-Mormon book should uh, keep the great tradition alive by plugging up the old loopholes where they appear. You're going to have to do a lot of mending of fences as you go along here. Um, treat the Mormon story as Mr. Wallace does, as a communal and perennial project. Do your best to improve it. Erase the mistakes of your predecessors, and there are plenty of them. Touch up their stories where they are weak. Quietly remove the contradictory material. Build up the story as you go along. You can do this without losing the slightest spice or flavor. Indeed, you can enhance it if you do your share. You can make the Mormons look worse without adding one new iota of information. See how Mrs. Analyza Young does it herself in her... Uh... Well, here's a good example. This is an example of how they work on this. Um... The oldest wife, Mary Angel of Brigham Young, went to live in the, uh, the big white house up the hill, back of the lion house, and then she went to live in the Gardo house with uh, the favorite wife, with uh, Amelia, which was a great privilege. She was very well taken care of and so forth. I found all this out up in Salt Lake, where she'd moved around and so forth. Now, Brigham Young used to have a school for his children, and they used to meet for instruction to be tutored in the big white house up the hill, the white house. And so this is the way, and Ann Eliza comes along and says it was as big as a barn. The common expression, use a house of beer, it was a huge house, you see. This barn of a house, she says. So this is the way it ends up in the hands of Mr. Wallace. The oldest wife of Brigham Young, who had served him most, ended up sharing a deserted schoolhouse with a cow. Now that's the way it looks in his book. You have a grim picture here of... His, his first wife, who had been so loyal, being put out in an old, beat-up, abandoned schoolhouse, you get a bright image of it, you see, with a cow. Well, a big as a barn, what lives in barns? Cows. You, this is the way you operate. That makes it look good. Pretty sad stuff. Now, um, a good example is this. Mrs. Stenhouse mentions a number of cases when people are killed by Indians, and some people suggest the Mormons did it. Uh, then along comes Ann Eliza Young and said, well, everybody knew it was really the Mormons who did it. And then Wallace follows along, and it's always, nobody is ever killed by Indians in Wallace's book. It's always Indians in quotation marks. It's always the Mormons that do the killing. Well, this is the way you can improve the story as you go, require you improve on your techniques. Whatever happens, never lose sight of your main object, and this you will find is common, which is not to depict the life or character of this or that person, but to smear a particular institution. Whatever you may say about individual Mormons, you must make Mormonism look either vicious or ridiculous. It may take some skill and time to avoid saying anything about them that sounds good, but Mr. Wallace shows that it can be done. <laughs> oh, he makes little concessions to their humanity. It makes them look not vicious but ridiculous. It does that. It redeems them. You see. Study the technique by which Mr. Wallace, writing the history of Brigham Young, manages to avoid any of the, any, mentioning any of the man's real accomplishments. This may appear a harsh rule, but if you carefully observe it, it will pay off. Here you have a gold mine, if you know how to handle it. 
Every successful anti-Mormon book to date has been made so by the willing cooperation of the clergy. You all always have a, a basic market you can count on there. There's a demand for this sort of thing. Now, and so we, it is not Anne Eliza, but Irving Wallace himself who inserts the irrelevant and perfectly false statement that the passing of the 15th Amendment still did not open the Mormon church to Negroes, that the archive room of the genealogical society is open only to Mormons. It is not the lady but her new sponsor who insists on working the word harem to death and referring constantly and mysteriously to the Mormon hierarchy without ever indicating of whom it might consist. Wallace opens his book with a keynote quotation, not from Ann Eliza or from Brigham Young, but, quote, from Joseph Smith, founder and first president of the Mormon church. The fact that those words were never uttered by the prophet, but are first found in a violently anti-Mormon book published in 1897, only underlines Mr. Wallace's determination to pin something on the Mormons at any cost. Wallace can smile at polygamy and on occasion applaud Brigham Young, but sinister is the word for Mormon. Here's a good example of that. Ann Eliza recounts with the vivid terror of her first night at the Walker House after she'd run away. And um, to be mur she was expecting, so she says, to be murdered in her bed any moment by the Gentiles because she was a Mormon. Since she'd been living and conniving with the most rabid Gentiles in Utah for some months, such naivete was, of course, impossible. She's simply making up a wild story. So Wallace changes it. She starts out fearing the Gentiles, but sometimes during the night she sees the point and shifts her ground to the fancied strangulation at the hands of one of Brigham's fanatical Danites. This quotation. Ann Eliza herself has nothing whatever to say about this. This is Wallace's own invention to correct Ann Eliza's obvious bungling. Her image of death shifted from the faceless Gentile to the familiar Mormon. No Danite, she decided in terror, would allow her to remain alive in this hostile hotel or to escape Utah territory. All this is Wallace's own contribution, so he must clinch it to justify the liberties he takes. Ann Eliza knew by heart many of the public threats Brigham Young had thundered against apostates, those who had forsaken the faith. Well, uh, this is another case of, uh, of using those, uh, your interpretation of it. All preachers in all ages have uh, predicted a dire fate for apostates. They would suffer, of course, the uh, hell. But he immediately interprets that, and Ann Eliza does, you see, as meaning, well, we're going to take care of them. It's the interpretation that's put on it every time. But notice, with practice skill, Wallace converts Ann Eliza's fancied strangulation, he calls it fancies, which he just invented, into proof for the existence of real Danites. And he uses that to prove there were Danites because she, was, she might have been afraid of them. Well, this is typical Jack that House builds. House, the Jack, no, Jack that House built. Uh, that's the building industry, isn't it? Well, our... Uh, Time is up now, and we've only had time to just to touch upon a few of these. Ten is a good round number. We'd like to talk about the portrait of Brigham Young here, the real history of Analyzer. You go through her book and, tell, and pick out the things she really experienced, every one of them. You can't find a more tame or safe existence. Uh, the portrait of herself, the great epic version of his wooing of, uh, of Analyzer and so forth. It's, uh, it's really quite amusing because there are various ways of checking this story. You know, the whole thing is broad. But this, these are the points you must observe to write a good anti-Mormon book. There's a solid nucleus of anti-Mormon interest that you can always count on. With them, anything goes. As Hausman wrote, the reader often shares the writer's prejudices. Of course, in this case, you've studied your reader's prejudices, so you know what they are to begin with. And is far too well pleased with the conclusion to examine either his premises or his reasoning. People want to believe this, and the book will sell. That's the reason. So you can't lose. It's like selling whiskey to the Indians. You're pushing downhill. You're giving people what, they, what you want to. You've canvassed the market, and you know there's a demand for it. 